Hello and good afternoon or good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, we're really delighted to be back on this uh, day two of our 2020 edition of Pathlake Masterclasses. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nasir Rajput. I'm co-director of Pathlake, which is a UK-based national center of excellence funded by Innovate UK and industry and also director of the Tissue Image Analytics Center at the University of Warwick. On behalf of the Pathlake Consortium and the TIA team at Warwick, I'm delighted to welcome you again, if you attended uh, the Tuesday session, uh, and if not, uh, again, welcome to this uh, uh, second session, uh, second day of our master classes. We've had an amazing response to the master class on day one, which was Tuesday, overwhelmingly positive feedback for all of our sessions on Tuesday. Uh, so thank you to all our speakers and um, uh, chairs um, and of course the audience uh, who attended on Tuesday. If you missed the session on Tuesday, despair not, uh, we are planning putting most of the contents on YouTube. Um, and now we are back today with another great lineup of speakers, um, including um, uh, our amazing speakers for the opening talks and uh, our flash talks as well as uh, we have a couple of industry sessions today, which are both uh, from AI vendors. Uh, and we have hands-on sessions plus a theory class on deep learning, uh, which I hope you would enjoy as much as you did uh, our classical machine learning introduction and hands-on session on Tuesday. Uh, and I'm delighted now to hand it over to Professor Claire Varel, who will be chairing the opening talk session today. Thanks so much, Nazir. Um, and I'd like to reiterate how good Tuesday was. It was really fantastic and uh, really looking forward to another super afternoon today. Um, so no, it's going to be brilliant. Um, so I'm Claire Verrill. I'm the Oxford um, PI for Path Lake and I'm a pathologist by background. Um, and that gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Professor Manuel Soltoteles, who's going to be talking to us about digital pathology and end aura means. Um, and Manuel is Chair of Molecular Pathology at Queen's University Belfast, a con clinical consultant pathologist and the lead of uh, Queen University Belfast Precision Medicine Centre of Excellence and the PI of Pathlake um, at Belfast. So thank you very much, Manuel. I think I can do that now. So th thank you very much um, once again for, for the very kind invitation and congratulations, Nasir and Warwick University for an extremely exciting and extremely well attended um, um, course. Um, it's, it's a privilege uh, to be here and um, I've structured a very practical lecture in which I'm aiming to answer three main questions. One is what are the arguments in favor of digitization of pathology services? Secondly, what is the IT framework that would ideally um, support this in the best possible way? And thirdly, what are the types of tools that are under development that are going to allow us to make the most of a digitized service. So let me start with the first question. Um, it's been very exciting to be a pathologist over the last um, 40 years. I'm not as old as that, but I can assure you that um, 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 we did extremely well uh, bringing a totally new taxonomy of the diseases with, with immunohistochemistry. We've done reasonably well at integrating molecular diagnostics to our routine uh, reporting. And over the last few years, we've been very clearly uh, uh, challenged with the idea of bringing digitization to our, to our diagnostic operation. The reasons why we should digitize our services are, are, are multiple. If you are in a tertiary reference hospital, it's very little that you can do with referrals from overseas, with um, um, activity in clinical trial materials that would not require that very firm uh, digitization. Something very hard, uh, very much in the heart of my colleague and friend, Filippo Fragetta, digital pathology increases your diagnostic accuracy. And this is very much uh, uh, presented and, and supported by a couple of studies led by David Sneed here in the UK. And also it's, it's at the core of laboratory quality. In fact, many of our accreditations are now uh, devoting a section on, on, on digitization. 
is very important as well for cost effectiveness. We're beginning to see that a service that is run in a digitized environment is, is significantly more cost effective. And also very important because we see that from the, from the current COVID-19 crisis, that being able to work remotely becomes an extraordinary enabler to be able to deliver pathology at many different levels and in, in many different ways. Um, how do we do that? And what are the main pieces that will lead to that digitization? And why is it so, so important? Well, if you try to walk this path in your hospital, you'll probably recognize some of these modules are essential as essential to start the digitization process. You need to know how you're going to generate your, your images, how you're going to storage and being able to recall them. The IMS that is going to be able to make the most of those images uh, brought into pathologist workstations and obviously with the possibility of bringing some applications. And needless to say, the links with the rest of the information systems that we have in our hospitals and that would make the whole um, exercise as meaningful as possible. Getting these pieces uh, individually is, is a procurement exercise. Coordinating the information management that is going to make the most of this is, is the big challenge that we are all having today. A challenge that is worth um, moving forward because the end result would definitely mean that th there will be a, totally, a total game changer in the way we do our, our pathology. And this is what we try to describe with my um, colleague, Mark Ahrens from Edinburgh, when we were looking at what do we need to actually make sure that our pathologies can work remotely? Because that in a way is the measure of quality that digitization is happening and is happening well. So we, we think that a pathologist working remotely needs access to slides, to laboratory requests, to the limbs, to the clinical information associated with that case. It needs access within the same department to be able to have consultations with other pathologists, the equivalent of taking a slide to the office next door to show to your colleague. And it should be able as well to do the sign outs with trainees, with residents in a remote way and in a totally in silico manner. When you move out from the department into the hospital, you should be able to start linking with your clinicians one-to-one -one and being able to discuss cases. And obviously, you should be able to contribute to remote, uh, remotely to multidisciplinary meetings in which you are discussing um, um, uh, therapeutic interventions in a significant number of patients. You should be able outside the hospital to engage with um, some of your colleagues with expert consultations, and you should be able to have access to your materials and to other lecture modules so that you can deliver your lectures in an interdepartmental or extramural way to other residents and to other pathologies um, and throughout. Hello? Have a system uh, like this. Sorry, yeah. I can't hear Manuel. Let me... You would be able to do this uh, adequately. The third question is what are the tools that we have in place to, 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 to do this? Again, um, very importantly, um, um, and this is something that I, I've, I've, I'm reviewing with, with Professor Eloy from Ipatimub in, in, in Portugal, there are many different tools that digitization allows us to apply as an enabler. Uh, tools that are able to identify histological features better than pathologists, or that can predict biomarker, molecular biomarker status, as you will see in the next presentation. You will see quantitation of biomarkers in a single way, and also the quantitation in a multiplex. And we can begin to explore the clinical meaning of a spatial distribution of, of, of cell types. And obviously, the one area that is still to, 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 to identify what the group of uh, Professor Nasik Rahput very elegantly uh, uh, shows in, 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 in one of his papers, the ability to mine sub-visual image features 
that probably is very much the gold standard that we are expecting for some of these applications. Um, this doesn't come without shortcomings. Remember, uh, um, um, uh, the uptake of, of machine learning tools so far, not only in pathology, in other areas as well, has been low, probably because we still lack high quality evidence. In fact, when, when Paul O'Reilly and Peter Hamilton uh, looked at this, um, they, they highlighted all the key challenges that we have today in the way we structure our studies, we develop our algorithms, the healthcare economics that, that are, 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 are falling behind. And the problem that we have, therefore, is that we have wonderful papers that are generating wonderful results with, for instance, 90% accuracy, which is very good for a research paper, but for a diagnostic application, 10% discordance obviously means that the tool is not applicable today. And, and, and this is one of the problems that we have. We decided to start overcoming some of these problems, um, um, working with colorectal cancer, as you will see, with, uh, with, with Cancer Research UK and now with Pathlake. Uh, Stephanie Craig was able to generate um, digital pathology analysis of many biomarkers associated with adaptive immuno immunity and immune checkpoint inhibition, applied it to more than five, 1,500 cases from three clinical cohorts within the UK and showed that the combination of CD3, CD4, and CD8 was able to have prognostic significant in stage two and three and predictive significant in stage four, very importantly. And the reason is essentially because there is a molecular signature behind that group that is very much associated with hypoxia and, and as, as, as the main um, um, leading uh, feature together with, 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 with immunity. When we translated this into Path Lake, what we are trying to do exactly is to bring that tool into proper artificial intelligence. And this is something that is led in our group by uh, Perry Maxwell and Dominic French and led very much by uh, Jasmine uh, Marhouf in, 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 in the AI um, space. Also in our group, Amelie uh, Viratham together with Stephanie Craig has been able to present multiplexing as a tool to specifically apply into routine diagnostics with the same level of confidence that you would do in, 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 in the, in the, in, 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 with say routine immunohistochemistry and Mark uh, Humphreys while he was with us was able to bring these two together in a way, as you can see, uh, uh, that was able to bring traditional digital pathology and, and, and immunofluorescence in a way that is um, um, logical and meaningful from the point of view of diagnostic workflows. Is this important? It is, and it's just the beginning. The degree of complexity that we are beginning to generate in a tissue hybridization manner is phenomenal. By in situ genomic sequencing, by in situ uh, spatial transcriptomics, by in situ proteomics, we are able to link spatial barcodes to next generation sequencing and generate three dimensional uh, um, genomic um, 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 mutational structures. Again, three dimensional and two dimensional transcriptomic features of significant complexity in, 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 in the cancers that we analyze. And even by the use of, of probes that are able to run um, um, uh, straightforward um, uh, Western blots and at the same time, high quality hybridization, we are able to bring proteomics at a tissue hybridization level. The degree of complexity that we can generate has only um, started. So with this in mind, with the idea that digitization of services is just the enabler to actually uh, start adopting um, um, uh, machine learning algorithms, and with the idea that these machine learning algorithms, once we have applied and established um, genomic analysis, probably represents the most important challenge that our generation as pathologists will have in the next 10 to 20 years. With this idea, I would like to leave you stressing 
that we need to digitize our services because it has many diagnostic advantages, but also because it serves a higher purpose. And I would like to finish thanking those that um, were at the core of probably one of the ex most exciting uh, digital pathology um, 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 initiatives in, in, in Europe. Uh, David, Nazir, Jackie James, Imad, Ian, uh, uh, Claire, our chair, Jens and, and Peter Hamilton, and of course, the extraordinary group in, in Belfast that is making Path Lake um, um, possible, um, including uh, um, Perry, Jackie and, and, um, and Dominique. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, Manuel. That, that was really enlightening and thought provoking. Um, we're going to take questions at the end after the next talk. Um, and if people could pop their questions into the Q&A function, um, that, that would be fantastic. And I will field those at the end. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Jacob Kather, um, who's going to talk to us about mutation prediction. Um, and he is a physician scientist, associate professor at um, W. RWTH um, Aachen University, Germany, with additional affiliations at the NCT Heidelberg, Germany, and the University of Leeds. Um, and he leads the computational oncology group um, at the RWTH University Hospital in Aachen, Germany. And it great, gives me great pleasure to introduce him today. So thank you very much, Jacob. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Can you see my slides and hear me well? We can, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so in the next 15 minutes, I am going to talk about our work um, that is related to predicting mutations directly from Agent E slides um, with deep learning. And um, so these are my um, these are my conflicts of interest. And let me start with the central assumption that we have. So we know that um, each tumor in in different patients each tumor is different and differs in terms of the genetic makeup. And we can measure that by next generation sequencing of the tumor um, of the tumor tissue itself. But we also know that in uh, basically throughout biology, the genetic alterations and um, the, the alterations on the genetic level change and shape the phenotype on the um, on a phenotypic level. So the genotype determines the phenotype. That's a basic um, paradigm in biology. And also in cancer, we know that specific genetic alterations in cancer um, cause specific morphological alterations in the tissue. And these changes can be in the tumor cells themselves. So we know that some um, mutations in the genome of a cancer can change the size of the tumor cells or can change the size of the nucleus or the shape of the nucleus, etc. But also these changes can be on a higher level. So they can influence the tumor microenvironment. And we know that some mutations, for example, cause, this, cause the immune system to um, attack the tumor more easily and thus more immune cells will be observable within the tumor tissue and also um, mutations in the tumor cells can influence the stroma around these around the tumor cells. So um, our hypothesis is that just by observing the morphology of the tumor, just by looking at a routine agent e slide, we can guess basically the genetic makeup of the tumor because this information is reflected in many, many parts of the tumor. And the tool we use to do that is, of course, deep learning. So deep learning is a very powerful tool that can infer um, very complex data, um, very complex features from visual data. And this is, of course, what we use here. And so if we think about clinical implementation of such methods, ultimately, so where do we want to go with that, is that if you imagine today, if a cancer patient goes to the hospital, and the cancer is suspected, and then um, a piece of the tumor or the whole tumor will be taken out um, by a surgery or a biopsy, part of the tumor will go to the routine histology evaluation and will be analyzed under a microscope by a pathologist. And at the same time, usually another piece of the tumor goes for genetic testing to um, to test for the presence of actionable genetic alterations in this tumor. And these are currently two different workflows, which are then integrated again by a pathologist or by a tumor board, um, actually where pathologists and clinicians 
and other disciplines meet and discuss the test results and then a treatment recommendation will be made. But currently these genetic tests in particular are pretty expensive. They take, can take a lot of time and they are not available in every single hospital. So our idea is if we use this relationship between genotype and phenotype in solid tumors, we could maybe um, lessen the need for genetic tests and run it all um, through here, through the um, evaluation of morphology. Um, how do we approach these problems in practice? Well, um, we start with a scan digitized with a digitized whole slide image of um, an HE stained sample. Um, we can take the whole the whole slide, or we can restrict the analysis to a to a part of the slide. Then, um, what we and others do is to cut these um, large images into smaller image tiles, um, which um, has the yeah which which has the benefit that our um, deep learning system has many much more instances to learn from and also this makes it much easier to apply um the um widely used deep neural network architectures to this problem and then we can pre-process these image tiles and train on some patients and test our system on other patients. And the um, deep learning technology that we use for that is just convolutional neural networks that are quite abundant nowadays in every, in almost every part of, um, of computer vision. And we train these networks um, typically by transfer learning. So these networks have been pre-trained on other non-medical tasks and we retrain them specifically on our medical tasks. And training means we have a bunch of images with an associated label. And this label can be, um, for example, um, uh, the presence of particular genetic alteration. So whether a given gene is mutated or wild type, but this label can also be anything else that we are interested in in the clinic, for example, um, patient survival or drug response or other clinical endpoints. And just to give you an overview of the field, so this is slightly outdated, it's from last year, but um, but the general picture still holds. So um, in this review, we summarized um, the studies that were um, we're using such um, deep learning based workflows to detect whether tumor tissue was present on a given um, digitized slide, um, how patients um, were going to respond to treatment, what would be the overall survival of patients, and um, this part um, on the top right in the top right corner is what I just discussed, whether a particular mutation was present in the tumor tissue. And you can see even in 2020, and now um, this has of course even um, become more common, um, we have seen a number of publications that show that by deep learning, you can infer the presence of specific genetic alterations directly from agent E images. And so this whole field started basically in 2018 with this paper from Codre by Codre et al, where they showed that in lung cancer, um, when you look at 10 of the most clinically relevant um, genetic alterations, six out of these 10 mutations could be predicted by deep learning just directly from the routine agent e histopathology. Our own group did a similar study um, in 2019 in colorectal cancer where we showed that microsatellite instability could be determined directly from agent e slides with deep learning with a pretty good performance. So the case of microsatellite instability is actually pretty interesting because even before deep learning, of course, it was known that microsatellite instability, a very clinically relevant genetic feature in colorectal cancer, leads to a specific morphology of these tumors. However, um, this was um, these features quantifying these features with the just with the human eye is not as good as. Um, as doing that automatically as subsequent publications have shown and in general microsatellite instability um, in colorectal cancer has become kind of a benchmark task for computational pathology. So um, following the first study in 2019, now um, nowadays um, at least 12 studies have looked at this and my student Amelie has um, recently summarized all the evidence on deep learning based MSI detection in colorectal cancer. And what you can see here is that as time goes by, um, really an increasing number of studies has, um, has um, addressed this clinical question and has tested the use of deep learning for um, MSI detection in colorectal cancer. And what you can see here on the right-hand side is the performance um, 
quantified as the area under the receiver operating curve on an external test set that these studies have yielded. And um, actually, it's pretty interesting that for many of these studies, the performance is, um, is, is very high, whereas um, the green dots here are the performance um, achieved um, achieved by other methods, um, for example, here by visual examination by um, by pathologists, and you can see here that actually a number of deep learning methods outperform this um, this um, visual um, determination of MSI status just based on HDE slides by pathologists. So we think that detecting MSI in colorectal cancer could be a very interesting benchmark task for the community to test new methods on. Um, well, one of the things, a number of factors influence um, the performance of new method in for detecting a specific genetic alteration in any cancer. One of the main factors, of course, is um, the size of the training set and in particular the number of patients in the training set and as we have shown last year um here on the left hand side if you for for the um, example of msi prediction in colorectal cancer if you increase the number of patients from 500 to uh, 5500 the performance on an external test set also increases, although it seems to plateau after a few thousand patients. And this is somehow compatible with this study by Campanella et al. Um, from 2019, where they show that the um, classification error goes down if you increase the number of um, whole slide images you, you train on. Um, how do we um, achieve this? How do we get so many samples to train on? Well, of course, the key is academic consortia, such as the Pathlight Consortium or other consortia, for example, our own MSI Detect Consortium, where we, in which we um, collected a few thousand cases of colorectal cancer to validate these computational pathology methods. And this is one of the publications that, um, that um, um, is based on the work in this consortium where we showed that um, really by training on a few thousand patients, you can get a pretty high area under the receiver operating curve of 0.96 for detecting MSI in an external validation cohort. One of the most interesting things about these um, workflows in, in my point of view is that um, they do not just give us a prediction for a given patient, but they also give us spatially resolved predictions. So we have seen in a number of studies, we have seen these um, nice heat maps where we can really see which area, which part of the tumor was most highly associated with a given molecular alteration. And in the case of MSI, usually these heat maps are quite homogeneous and quite smooth, such as here on the left-hand side and in the middle part. But um, sometimes what we see is a pattern like here on the right-hand side, where we have a high degree of heterogeneity within a given tumor. And the big question, of course, is, is this um, phenotypic heterogeneity also related to genetic heterogeneity, or is it just a technical artifact? So um, this is an aspect that was addressed by another student in my group, Chiara, recently for the um, for for the um, example of um, FTFR3 mutations in bladder cancer, so another clinically relevant mutation in a common tumor type. And what she saw there was when she applied um, a supervised deep learning system to detection of these mutations. And then, um, then there was one patient in our test set that had a very striking heterogeneity. So the top part of the tumor was predicted to be mutated and the bottom part of the tumor was predicted to be wild type. And indeed, when we went back to the tumor tissue and they were, um, and these parts were um, separately sequenced, um, we saw that indeed the top part was mutated and the bottom part was wild type. So um, what we and what this shows is that the um, phenotypic heterogeneity that we can measure with these deep learning methods can in some cases be due to actual biological genetic heterogeneity of the tumor. Of course, these are just some examples of um, of some clinically relevant mutations. Last year, we have seen a number of studies that have shown that um, these methods are not restricted to just a handful of mutations, but are really ubiquitously applicable to almost any um, type of solid tumor. Um, what we what what we and others found out pretty consistently is that um, whenever you look at hundreds of genes and you check whether you whether deep learning can predict the genotype of these genes directly from histology, um, that for 
two thirds of the genes that we looked at, um, these methods don't really work, but for approximately one third of the um, genetic alterations we looked at, we saw a signal. So these approximately a third of all the genetic alterations could be um, predicted um, to some degree directly from the agent E. Um, so, um, I'm almost um, I'm almost at the at the end of my talk. Um, just as a last slide, let me show you um, a possible outlook for this field because I showed you um, I already mentioned that often the bottleneck is data availability, especially when it comes to collecting large cohorts of patients where you have tissue and also the um, information about genetic um, alterations or the mutational status of these tumors. So what we recently showed in this. And this study here is that you can actually use um, um, generative neural networks um, to train um, that can be trained on real images and can then be used to generate synthetic images. So here, these histology image patches, they, they are and were generated by a neural network. Um, but still, what we showed in this study is that these gen generated image patches retain information about molecular alterations. And this could potentially um, help to solve data sharing issues because often clinical data cannot be shared in its um, raw form, but has to be anonymized in some way. And we think that maybe these generative networks could be a way to anonymize and thus um, make data shareable. Um, so um, that's the end of my talk. I think the most um, crucial ingredient um, for future developments we need in this field is interdisciplinary workshops um, such as this one. And of course, it's a pity that this one has to be virtual. Last year, we had the past lake meeting um, physically in London, and that was um, really great and really stimulated a lot of ideas and a lot of collaboration. So thank you very much to the past lake team, especially, especially Nazir Rajput. And, um, Thank you very much for listening. This is my interdisciplinary team in Aachen. So we are a group of clinicians, biologists, engineers, computer scientists, all working together to apply these methods in clinically relevant um, in a clinically relevant scenario. So thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Jakob. That was that was fascinating, and I've I've watched your work as it's been coming out for the last couple of years. It's it's really sort of groundbreaking and uh, and and uh, extremely interesting. So thank you so much. Um, right, we've got about five minutes for questions. Um, if people can pop their questions in the Q and A function, um, that that would be brilliant. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd like to invite uh, Manuel back as well, so we can take some questions. So there's one quick one um, for Jakob. Uh, on the bladder cancer case, do you know what was the histological classification of the tumour? Um, yes, so actually we, um, we um, our pathologists actually characterise these tumours quite, quite extensively and you can all look it up in the publication, of course. Um, but also in bladder cancer, I mean, as this insinuates, um, we know that some histological subtypes are related to specific alterations. So these are especially the cases um, where we where we would expect these deep learning methods to work um, to to work well. Yeah, please have a look at at our paper and 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 get in touch if you want to collaborate on this. Fantastic, thank you. Um... A question from Antonio, who says, um, two excellent talks, um, so thank you. Um, and maybe we'll start with Manuel on this one. Um, what happens to the ultimate goal of a scientist, which is to understand, um, given that we don't understand deep learning and it has implications in implementation, um, generalization is a problem. How can we be sure we're not just overfitting the data? Obviously, that's the million dollar question. And, and, and the answer is, 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 is difficult. So obviously, understanding the or what we call explainable artificial intelligence is is something that we can all relate to. Um, I think that what perhaps you could call unexplainable um, artificial intelligence requires the studies of this is very important, and I think part of the work that Jacob has very eloquently put together explains that where we have holistic genomic information of those cases because it's very likely that some of the features that we understand today that are unexplainable may indeed be a representation of a very clear um, um, transcriptomic um, signature 
um, 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 solid um, um, and hidden mutation um, 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 that exists in the tumor. Um, we may be looking at hypermethylation um, uh, uh, features. It is very important that those cohorts that we are analyzing have as much genomic information as possible, because obviously, eventually, we need to explain what we see. That's very clear. Great, thank you. Right, we've got a question um, from Fraser. Uh, this is probably one for uh, Jacob. Um, is there a risk using neural network generated images rather than live cases that any errors in the um, original machine learning algorithms become self-perpetuating? Yes, definitely. So this um, this whole field of using generative models is is just um, starting, and um, we have actually seen very few studies that have addressed this. Of course, there's a number of problems associated with this, um, and one of the biggest problems is um, that um, biases can be perpetuated by these by these systems. So I'm optimistic. I think that ultimately, if we refine these methods a little bit and if we train on big heterogeneous um, co patient cohorts, we can overcome this. But I hope that the next one or two years will clarify clarify this. Great, thank you. Um, one a question from Manuel. Um, you've not, you've nicely described your your um, immune profiling in colorectal cancer um, tool. How what do you think are the barriers from kind of having your proof of concept version to actually using that um, in in your clinical practice? Oh, you're on mute, Manuel. Apologies. That's that's a question that we are asking ourselves um, all the time, and and I think is very um, very relevant. Um, what should be the clinical validation that we provide for our tools so that they are applicable in in routine in routine pathology? And I, I can see that there are two um, schools of thought: those who would like to bring as much complexity to the cohorts that we are analyzing so that that tool can address as much complexity as possible. But I think it's interesting to indicate that in other areas of diagnostics, we don't do that. In other areas of diagnostics, what we do is that we look at a very specific uh, fixation with a very specific, say, nucleic acid extraction, with a very specific detection method, and with a very specific interpretation. So it could be that at the end of the day, our tools should be very specific for a very characteristic pathway in, 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 in the laboratory and perhaps not as, as broad or as universal as we are trying to, to, to do. I, I'm not sure that I agree 100% with that, but I'm just putting that as an option on how perhaps we can, we can fill that gap between a promising tool and a tool that is actually fully applicable diagnostically. Great, thank you. I'll just, there's one other quick question on the chat and then um, I'll wind the session up. Um, just another one for Jakob. Um, does the location of the mutation within the gene matter, i.e. functional versus non-functional mutations for h &E prediction? Yeah, excellent question. And we have tried to look at that. Um, um, the problem is that we did not yet have enough data to conclusively answer this question. So in the TCGA, um, so the TCGA cohort is basically the only large cohort that has matched um, histopathology and, um, and the um, whole exome and, 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 and now also whole, whole genome sequencing available. So we have looked at the influence of different, um, um, different ver genetic variants, even in the same gene. But then um, the deeper you go, the smaller your sample sizes get. And then, um, and then the, um, yeah, the, it becomes much, much harder even to relate that to histopathology. So again, I think here the solution is to put together um, larger cohorts from an academic um, consortia, ideally with also genetic um, characterization so that this can be answered. Great, thank you so much. Um, with that, I think I'm going to draw the session to a close. There are still loads of questions flying in. Everyone's very excited about uh, these sessions. So um, I believe the speakers can answer those um, offline on, on the Q&A um, uh, function. So, so that will be fantastic. And I, I'd like to thank again our two speakers from the opening session. Really, really um, thought provoking and a fantastic start to the rest of the afternoon. So, so thank you again.
Um, brilliant. Okay, and <laughs> that um, leads me on to the next session, and I'd like to introduce the next chair, um, who is Dr. Ali Karam, and uh, yep, the chair is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Claire. Um, and thank you, Nasir, for asking me to chair this session. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce the, the first speaker, uh, who's Professor Tom Sorrell. Uh, he's a professor of politics and philosophy and uh, head of the Interdisciplinary Ethics Research Group at the University of Warwick. Um, Tom is also the vice chair of the Home Office uh, Bioethics, uh, Biometrics Ethics Group, and he's on the Data Analytics Committee of the West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner. And I'll be sharing Tom's presentation. So just give me a second. So over to you, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, my topic is ethical issues in computational pathology, but really all I have time to do is to indicate what the issues are. Um, I'm not in a position to, to discuss any of them at great length, um, but I do think just, just to put um, my cards on the table, I do think that a lot of these issues are entirely resolvable. So if I could go on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a bit of a menu of um, what I want to talk about. Um, I want to uh, maybe consider uh, indications of a difference of culture between uh, data science and um, medical ethics uh, scruples uh, and some of the uh, data ethics scruples that have begun to, to develop lately. Um, I'll then go on to research ethics, uh, the way that uh, computational pathology might collide in certain cases with research ethics. The collision is only superficial, I think, but there's an apparent collision. Um, there are some issues uh, arising from the intelligibility of algorithms. Some of them have probably already been discussed today. Um, and there are some liability and trust issues that arise from intelligibility issues. And finally, there's a tailpiece uh, in, in my talk, if I get to it, uh, to do with the business ethics of computational pathology and some of the commercial interests that um, attach to this area. If we could go on to the next thing, please. So here I, I spoke earlier about the, um, I mentioned the, uh, the, the culture clash. And I think the, the, the culture clash is basically to do with what I, I'd like to call data hunger in data science. And, um, maybe the scruples about how much data is used uh, for almost any purpose um, in, uh, in data ethics as we have it now. So um, uh, more specifically, I guess that many people in data science think, um, especially for training sets, that the more uh, data one has, the better. And in the case of WSIs um, and other kinds of data that can be used um, in uh, in AI uh, assisted research, uh, the kind of data that's being used belongs to a protected category that is protected in the sense of GDPR uh, because it's health data. So there's this tension between using large amounts of protected data and uh, the data hunger that one associates with data science. Next slide, please. One way of crystallizing this tension is by asking whether the data in whole slide images is personal data. And um, uh, this is, this is a, a difficult uh, question and points to some problems in the conceptualization of uh, personal data in the GDPR. But broadly, uh, roughly, um, for something to be personal data um, is for uh, it to be data from which the identity of a data subject can be inferred, and that can is uh, very tricky. So it's, it's well known that, um, for example, that under GDPR, the distinction between anonymization and pseudonymization is very, very tricky to capture because uh, lots of pseudon pseudonyms that can be used and pseudonymizing techniques are in principle able to be um, uh, so to speak, deconstructed 
And so whether one has true anonymity when one uses pseudonyms um, is, is a real issue. Um, now, if one had lots of computational techniques and one knew where the data sets came from and which the uh, doctors had, had contributed to them and so on, there might be a way of, of coming up with the identities of uh, some of the people associated with, um, uh, with some whole slide images. Um, it's very unlikely, it's very improbable, but it's, it's possible. And we, we're back to that idea that if it can be inferred, it's probably personal data. Uh, and then you start to see the issue um, is, you know, is there a limit uh, to uh, what can be inferred? And uh, if there's not, um, uh, then uh, a lot of data might be personal data, uh, even WSI data, and subject to a lot of these constraints. Um, uh, another issue that, that arises here is um, that the uh, the data that's used for some algorithms in uh, biobanking and uh, in computational pathology is secondary data, that is data collected for one purpose and used for another. When large data sets have been assembled and the, um, you know, the sources of the data are not always clear, um, it's not always clear whether uh, anyone is keeping track any longer of the purposes for which the data were collected and perhaps collected with consent. And that raises issues about whether repurposing of data, which is subject to constraints in data ethics and subject to constraint in research ethics, whether those norms about repurposing um, are even being acknowledged or uh, uh, whether anyone's conscious of them. Um, a further issue that's close to home in the Path Lake project is whether a data lake of the kind that we have is a data archive, that is something from which data can be extracted and where data can be consulted, or whether it's more than a data archive, that is where the data is being used to train algorithms where it's producing material for computation. Um, it seems to me that there might be a, a, an interesting uh, issue uh, relevant to uh, research ethics over this difference between a data archive and a data lake used in roughly the way that we use it in this project. Next slide, please. Um, there are some other issues that arise from algorithms. Um, here I allude to some of the um, algorithms that have had a lot of negative press coverage, like the algorithms in um, some facial recognition uh, technology um, that have been trained on unrepresentative data sets. Uh, there, there is the use of algorithms uh, for selecting from a very large pool people who might be suitable employees. Uh, those are sometimes subject to gender stereotyping based on um, uh, gender information or thought to be gender information in applications. Um, and in policing, there are many, many uh, areas where um, algorithms are subject to uh, stereotypes that, um, uh, in, that suggest bad decision making. Um, if we can just uh, move to the next uh, slide, please. Um, a further issue about uh, algorithms, apart from whether they rely on <coughs> misleading stereotypes, is um, how they fit into the consent processes on the part of patients and also communication uh, processes from uh, doctors to patients. <clears throat> so here the issue is that if patients really don't understand AI-driven technology and don't understand AI-driven diagnostics, um, and they're asked to consent to uh, being given uh, AI-driven diagnostics, do they understand what they're being asked about? Um, and if, if it's questionable that they do, is the consent valid? Similarly, is, it, um, uh, is the, uh, the difficulty of uh, doctors knowing about these techniques, uh, is that somehow crippling for recommendations they make to patients about using uh, these kinds of diagnostics or communicating results um, of these diagnostics and vouching for their reliability if they're not sure 
about the uh, reliability of AI uh, uh, driven um, um, technology. Um, and then this is not to mention the black box problem. That is to say the, um, the lack of intelligibility of some machine learning processes, even to uh, computer scientists. That's a further dimension of the issue that I'm talking about. Next slide, please. So um, this slide mentions a couple of papers that uh, try to get underneath um, the issue about the intelligibility of, of algorithms and how one could, could introduce intelligibility into algorithms, maybe simpler algorithms than we're talking about here. Um, and there are other uh, kinds of approaches to this, um, like data science, science education among the general public or in schools, and new techniques for um, data science uh, uh, communication uh, in general, as well as informed consent communication involving uh, AI techniques. Next slide, please. Um, so there are trust and liability issues that are, are connected with the, the sort of uh, divide between uh, medics who have uh, AI expertise or exposure to, um, to AI-driven techniques and doctors who don't, also the divide between patients in general uh, and data scientists on the one hand and medics on the other. All of these uh, uh, differences of training and, and, and understanding um, affect uh, what can be responsibly communicated to uh, patients um, and uh, what patients have reason to trust um, in the advice that they're being given. Um, there are also legalities. Uh, I mentioned only one, which is that uh, Article 22 of the GDPR um, says that um, processes that have important consequences for people should not be automatic, and that people have a right to have human-mediated uh, uh, judgment in their decision processes. Next slide, please. So. Um, I'm coming to, uh, uh, just uh, to uh, indicate the, the last, which very different kind of issue. This is uh, the, the uh, issue of the, the business ethics side of a computational um, pathology. Um, and this is to do with uh, the responsibilities of say the scanner manufacturers and also the process by which uh, algorithm developers should pay for and uh, the, the data they use and how that benefit should be uh, uh, you know, directed back either to the NHS or to patients or to somebody else. This is a large area of what fair value means and what appropriate commercial use of data of this kind should be. That's my presentation, thank you. Thanks a lot, Tom. Really fascinating and interesting aspect of uh, AI research. And uh, hopefully we'll have some questions towards the end as well. So thanks a lot for your time. Um, our next speaker is an ever-present part of these Path Lake masterclasses, Andrew Janovich. Uh, and Andrew is an assistant research professor at the Center of Computational Imaging and Personalized Diagnostics, CCPI, CCIPD, just rolls off your tongue, uh, at Case Western University in the USA, but he's also a senior bioinformatician at the Swiss Institutes of Bioinformatics and a senior research assistant at the Precision Oncology Center of the Lausanne University Hospital. Um, over to you, Andrew, thank you very much. Great, thanks so much. So I'm here to talk about uh, quality control issues in digital pathology, a topic near and dear to my heart. So my claim is that we have an unmet need for, for quality control in digital pathology, and that as we transition to digital pathology workflows, really having a digital quality control that matches that digital workflow is going to be paramount. Ideally, we'd like to be able to identify poor quality slides early in that process, uh, so that we can immediately rescan them if they're blurry or, or recut them if there's some type of staining issue before they get to a pathologist. So we could kind of close the, close the manufacturing loop there, and that typically results in cost and efficiency savings. So if we look at the cancer genome atlas breast cancer cohort, we could see some examples of images with poor quality 
Um, here we see that there's some cracks through the cover slip. We see that there's uh, air bubbles stuck under the cover slip, which means this tissue is completely out of focus and, and uh, unreadable. Uh, we have tissue folds here. We have some kind pathologists that have annotated this slide with a marker, and then it was scanned in. So now that's a permanent part of the image. And we see instances of knife chatter as well. Now, previously, this wasn't so insurmountable. So many years ago, when I was doing my PhD, the cohort sizes were maybe 5 or 10, 20 slides. We would simply spend an afternoon, manually delineate the regions that were uh, of good quality, and then simply go on with our experiment. But of course, now as we're starting to see cohorts that range into the thousands and 10,000s, it's really not possible to do this manually. Uh, and maybe more importantly, it's not reproducible. So where I determine is good, you might not determine is good, or slides I determine are bad, you may not determine are bad. One main idea that we wanna take away from uh, all the talks both, both today and, and yesterday is that especially in, in machine learning and in particular deep learning, if we have garbage in, we're gonna get garbage out. So if, is this tissue fold related to that patient's cancer diagnosis? Probably not. So it just represents noise to the system and, and it would be better if we could uh, avoid that. So we need better quality control of these uh, slides. We put out a paper earlier this year that shows that there's actually a surprising lack of reproducibility when performing manual QC. So we took 330 slides, we provided a protocol with examples of, of bad quality slides, and we asked three independent readers a simple question. Is this slide good enough to computationally an analyze? So we're basically asking them to curate a data set. And then we looked at the concordance uh, of those three readers on those 330 slides. And we see that the actual agreement is quite low, right? And we're, we're looking at agreements of, of 0.73, some kappas in, in the 0.26 range. And if you think about what this actually means, this means that these three readers, if they each conducted the same experiment using the same code, using the same features, using the same everything, they would have actually received different results simply because even before that experiment began, their quality control process was different and they've opted to include different slides into their, into their cohorts. So this, you can imagine the, the ramifications of this uh, sort of thing. And essentially, if we have irreproducible quality control, we're going to have irreproducible experiments. We can't have people go and look at, for example, the TCGA and say, oh, I use the breast cancer slides, I perform quality control, and I remove 20% of the slides. Someone else does the same thing, and those 20% are not the same. We also see concerns associated with batch effects that most pathologists, I think, are probably pretty familiar with. It's this idea that non-biological factors are uh, causing changes in the data and that those factors are somehow associated with uh, an outcome of interest. And, and that's, the, that's a really bad uh, worst case scenario. So here's a, a simple example to hopefully drive this home. Let's say Sloan Kettering produces pathology images that are darker than other hospitals. Maybe the scanners tuned a little bit on the, the more contrast side or they're, they're overstaining slightly. And we also know that Sloan Kettering will typically see patients with more aggressive uh, forms of disease, just as, a, uh, as it being a very top class uh, research hospital. So now it becomes interesting because if I know that a slide is dark, then it, it can naturally indicate that that patient is likely to have a more aggressive disease, even though it has nothing to do with the underlying biology or, or that particular patient itself. So to more concretely illustrate this, let's say we have group one, this is a poor prognosis group. We have group two, this is a better prognosis group. And I try and ask you to assign these to individual categories. You'll probably say, I'll put this one with this one and this one with this one. Now, what's interesting there is that I know that you've not taken any biological factors into account because these images are exactly the same, except these are rotated 90 degrees so that you don't visually pick up on that, that little trick. So how have you done that grouping? Again, you've done it basically by appearance and not taking into any of the underlying biological information. This is a real world example of, of how this may affect an experiment. Uh, we were working with a pathologist and it, as he was going through his daily work, he was finding interesting cases. And those interesting cases, he put a red dot in the corner so that they would be able to be found later for scanning. Um, at the same time, the fellow, uh, he also asked his fellow, you know, grab some undotted cases and we're going to use those as, as controls for later on. So they ended up training an end-to-end -end deep learning classifier to try and identify the patients with, the, with this particular condition. And lo and behold, that classifier performed fantastic because that test set was created at the same site. And that same site is associated with these, uh, that the positive cases were associated with that red dot. So now that pathologist went and told all of their colleagues, actually, we're, we found the cure for this. This is amazing. We, and our, our algorithm is perfectly able to go and identify this sort of stuff. Um, and rightfully, their, their colleagues then said, well, can we send you some of our examples? They said yes. So they received those examples. They tried to use it. Uh, and the classifier predicted all of the samples of being in the second class because no one spent the time to put 
a red dot in the corner for the positive class. So this kind of leads to this question of maybe these, I think I have this, this red pointer on here that I need to uh, disable. So maybe these artificial intelligence algorithms are, are really not that intelligent if they can get simply tripped up by these, these small batch effects. How would you see batch effects in digital pathology? Lots of, lots of possibility for them to be introduced. We see differences in stain intensity and, and slight tissue differences, uh, thicknesses in tissue. There's also some scanning concerns associated with brightness, uh, different levels of compression as you save the image. Microns per pixel is especially interesting because it essentially means that each pixel that the computer has access to corresponds to a different physical length, uh, which can lead to some uh, batch effects there as well. So what's a potentially likely solution that's also the worst case? Let's say we create a tissue microarray that contains only high-risk patients, another tissue microarray that has only low-risk patients, then essentially any artifact introduced to either of those slides during that process will allow those groups to be perfectly separated. So here we can see these images on the top are, let's say, bad prognosis, but they're also more blue. On the bottom, they're more pink, and maybe they're good prognosis. Now I just need to ask you what color the tissue is. You say it's pink. I'll say, oh, then I know it's good prognosis. And uh, in fact, I should not be able to do that. So to kind of help uh, make these, these problems more visible and to start proposing some solutions, we built a tool called HistoQC, which is an open source keyword here, reproducible program that uh, produces uh, quality metrics and helps localize the artifacts. It has a Python backend and it has a, a front end for visualizing that. So one feature that I'd like to discuss for HistoQC, because I think it's hopefully quite intuitive, is the user can provide a template. So I go and say, I like this H&E image. This is my template image. I can compute a distribution of the red, green, and blue channel. Now, if I go and give you another template, hopefully you see template one looks different than template two. Naturally, the distributions look different. And that, that's all you need to take away from this. These images look different, the distributions look different. So now when I have a new image, and this is maybe the routine scanning is being performed, I have a new whole slide image, I can perform that same process and produce another distribution. I have another uh, whole slide image here, I can produce another distribution. Now what becomes interesting is that once these are both in, in a, the same space, I can actually measure the distance between them, right? So hopefully I don't have to convince you that template one looks like this image and template two looks like this image. And unsurprisingly, when you measure how similar these distributions are, they're, they're very, very similar. So this now starts up to allow both histo technicians to ask the question, is my slide within tolerance? So if you're trying to have a, a good consistent quality uh, at your site, you could say it has to be within these bands. If it's outside of these bands, then we need to redo this slide. Similarly, it allows us to start asking questions about our algorithm. If I've trained my algorithm on all images that look like this, and I receive an image that looks like this one on the right, should I still use this algorithm or should I raise a red flag and say, actually, this is outside of my bounds of confidence? So this will essentially allow me to pre precisely specify ranges where I've, I've both trained my algorithm, but more importantly, where I've tested it. So if it's outside of there, we could say, maybe we need to uh, be more weary of that. So this is the user interface for HistoQC. Uh, I just want to point out that the, this is the original image here, and you see the overlay where it's identified is, is good for computation here. Each of these axes is a metric that we've computed, and each of these um, blue lines is a slide. So we can see immediately there's some grouping of these slides. These are potential batch effects that we should look at. There's also some outliers that we should review. So if we zoom in on that particular outlier, we see that, okay, this is a pen marking type feature. Um, and we see that there's a slide that's sticking out. We say, what is that? In fact, this happens to immediately pull up that image that I showed earlier. We see that, okay, there's some uh, pen marking there. Maybe we can't use it for our study because if we know there's a pen marking, we already know that there's a cancer there. What can we do with these outliers? We basically just make a decision. If it's a very, very poor quality. We simply remove it from the entire cohort. If the rest of the image is okay, we can make sure to avoid that bad region. So here's one of those air bubbles I showed you before. We would basically just toss this slide entirely. While on the other hand, this image can probably be uh, salvaged because this the, the um, pen marking is not on the tissue and we can identify where in the region is, is good quality and then we can simply compute within that region. And HistoQC actually generated this mask for us in a reproducible way. We can also use HistoQC to identify batch effects. We can simply look at visually at any axis. We can draw a line and say, oh, there are a bunch of slides above and a bunch of slides below. And this kind of indicates that something might have taken place. So a concrete example, we can see we're looking at the top of this particular metric and we see all of these images are kind of dark. Uh, now we can look at the bottom of this metric. We can see all of these images are kind of light. This is not immediately a problem. But now if I tell you that all of these top images are a specific form of canine cancer, and all of these bottom images that are much lighter are a different form of canine cancer, this is a problem because our 
our this metric allows us to separate this data simply by the label. So I can go and say, is it very pink? Yes. Well, then it's this type of cancer. And I don't even have to look at the slide itself, which is uh, should be a little concerning. We've also been able to show again with these 330 slides that if we take these HistoQC quantitative features, we can embed them in a two dimensional space where each dot is a slide and the color represents the site that it comes from. And we can start to see that all of these yellow dots are from the same site, but they're all slides from the same site. They're all from the same region. We can go and then perform statistical tests. And this allows us to statistically identify sites that have batch effects present within them. And this helps us think about maybe we need to modify our, our experimental design. So lastly, once we used HistoQC with the uh, readers from the first experiment I mentioned, we said, hey, use this reproducible tool and try and re-quality control that those 330 slides to see if you could come up with the same, uh, the same cohort. We see that the agreement has actually rose by over uh, 23 uh, absolute percent there. And the kappas are now in the, the 90 range. So we see that just by using a quantitative quality control approach that has reproducible features, people that use that tool are much more likely to do their own manual quality control uh, in a reproducible way. And the tool is available here. I have a blog that discusses a lot of these, these things as well, um, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Very, very important um, issue uh, that you've sort of covered and a very useful tool. Uh, there's already a few questions for you, but uh, we can uh, cover those towards the end. Thank, thanks a lot for, for your talk. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Faisal Mahmood, uh, and it's good to see you virtually, Faisal. Um, I think we've exchanged a few emails. Uh, he'll be talking about challenges in computational pathology. Uh, Faisal is an assistant professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and the Division of Computational Pathology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's also a full member of the uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Cancer Center and associate member of the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. You may have also heard his name uh, being said in hushed tones uh, due to a recent Nature publication, which we may hear about. So over to you, Faisal, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just gonna start by trying to share my screen. Okay, so I hope that everyone can see my screen. I'll be talking about challenges in computational pathology today. Um, and um, I'll, be tr uh, I'll try to go through things that um, some of which have already been covered and some of them, some of which have not been, uh, been, been covered in this, uh, in this session so far. So uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview, what my, my group does, we, we work on uh, analyzing a lot of phenotypic data and we do a lot of quantitative spatial analysis with the aim of getting to early diagnosis, prognosis, prediction of response to treatment, patient stratification and integrated biomarker discovery. And we also like to integrate a lot of existing quantitative information in, 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 form, in the form of uh, a lot of multi-omic data, uh, genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic data that we have access to being at the uh, at the Dana Farber Cancer Center. So um, we we build multimodal uh, methods to integrate all of this information to get to all of these these outcomes, and we try to uh, address the the technical challenges associated with doing a lot of that. So here's a here's a sort of a, a semi-exhaustive list of challenges in computational pathology. I'll be talking about very quickly today. Um, and uh, they're, they're related to limited data annotation, uh, limited available annotated data. If you want to target really large scale problems, there's not um, good annotations available for, for the data domain adaptation, which means if you train on data from one source, as one source it might not adapt very well to data from, from another source. I'll talk a little bit about what kind of unique strategies we're trying to adapt to. Uh, to address that in a holistic manner, structured prediction, a lot of the deep learning uh, methods that are fashionable and in use today, they're not very context context aware. Um, and then incorporating information from multimodal sources, so multimodal information incorporation is sort of an open 
open problem and has been studied extensively. Um, and then model interpretation and how, how can we start demystifying the black box while addressing these large scale uh, problems. So limited annotated data, so that just as from for, for some reference, there is a lot more pathology data than radiology data collected at more in, in modern uh, hospitals in the US as, as we're moving towards or sort of digitizing everything and then everything that's, that comes in from cytology, there is a lot more uh, data in, in pathology and in comparison to, to some of the other, other departments. And uh, there's there's a lot of uh, work that has been done on how can we deal with limited limited uh, available data in terms of transfer learning by by the conventional machine learning community. Um, and just to give a sort of a brief overview of what has been said already, uh, there um, there are sort of two approaches to how you can train these models. There's a supervised approach or a semi-supervised approach where you have uh, annotation, some form of annotation that is available uh, for uh, on on these whole slide images. Someone could have gone in and annotated this region, and you could train a deep model on top of that. Or there are weekly supervised approaches, and those predominantly these days they involve graph convolutional network based approaches where you segment all the nuclei in the in the image for the categorize them perhaps and then build a build a slide level graph and 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 uh, use some form of graph convolutional networks on top of that or there are multiple instance learning based approaches these are the approaches that use the entire slide there's another category of approaches where they might be sampling from the slide that I won't, I won't basically talk about. A typical approach for deep learning for computational pathology has been that someone goes in and annotates a, a region of region of interest. Those that region of interest is further annotated in terms of in terms of patches, or it could be refined in terms of patches and and a, and a CNN is sort of trained on top on top of that. And, and you could use all kinds of things to make this more interpretable by looking at grading class activation maps and 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 whatnot. So the the issue with this is that as you scale, as you want to the, 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 these diseases are of, of course very heterogeneous. You want to have a lot more patients. If you have multiple classes, multiple tasks that you want to solve simultaneously, you wouldn't be able to get annotations. And if you want to solve tasks that are associated with non-human identifiable phenotypes, you wouldn't know which regions to potentially uh, potentially target. Um, so we built this uh, this pipeline, we call it CLAM. So it, it uses some bells and whistles. I'll, I'll briefly talk about that. So it uses uh, attention-based aggregations when we have a whole slide image. Uh, it it, it uh, learns what region of the, of the whole slide is most most important sort of on its own. It has n parallel attention branches, which means that you can begin to solve um, multi-class uh, problems. And it uses pseudo labels. A lot of these are large images. A lot of the data sort of gets um, is not is not harnessed. So it, 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 as the model starts learning, it uses pseudo labels from what is what it what it has already learned to uh, further sort of uh, refine the, the the model as it as it continues to to train. So um, and then of course what, what we learned was that pre-trained ResNet encoders work very well. And this this was learned by using a plethora of recent self-supervised methods like SimCLR and and then CPC and whatnot. And we have some uh, some some conf conference articles on that. Um, so the way this this pipeline basically works, you have a whole slide image. It starts by segmenting out the tissue. Once you have once you've segmented out the tissue, you can patch uh, patch the entire entire whole slide. We extract ResNet features from that. There's an attention backbone that's learning which region of the whole slide or which patches are most important. And then there is a there there are multiple. Uh, uh, attention branches, which sort of categorize each one of the classes that we are looking at, and and, and towards the end, there's attention pooling to to make a slide level prediction. There's also instance level clustering that sort of uh, groups together and clusters similar similar regions within the within the whole slide. Um, and then there's, uh, as I said, attention pooling, try, trying to uh, find what region is most important and weighing that region. Uh, in, uh, in in a more significant manner, and then towards the end, it's it's interpretable. So you'll get, you'll be able to get slide level interpretability, and then there are some additional bells and whistles that you can use to get further further uh, sort of semi pixel level or or cell level interpretability as well. So we 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 tested this with a number of different problems. We tested data efficiency. So I I'll, I'll talk about a few of those here. So this is for renal cell carcinoma subtyping. It's uh, we posed this as as being a three class problem. We looked at how how data efficient the models are by subsequently decreasing the number of number of slides that were used for for training, going from 710 
slides all the way down to about about 70 uh, 70 slides and, and and even at 70 slides the the, the model overall model sort of stays quite data uh, data efficient and then adapting the the model that was trained on the TCGA to to in-house data worked uh, worked very well and it's interpretable at the level of the slide so you can you can look at some of these heat maps um, we also tested this with the chameleon benchmark and and had uh, pretty good performance on that. It was very adaptable. Again, training on Chameleon 16 and 17 and adapting it to in-house data. We looked at sort of an enhanced form of interpretability where and, and, did, and did some correlation between what the model was picking out with A1, A3 staining, which stains for breast cancer in the uh, in, in the lymph node. And there's some some enhanced analysis on this in the in the publication. We targeted the problem of tumors of unknown primary uh, for people who don't know when cancer metastasizes from one region and moves from one one organ to the other sometimes it becomes unclear where the where the primary tumor is and uh, the the treatment is typically based off of the primary tumor so identifying the tumor origin is uh, has a lot of a lot of value so we used uh, uh, about 22,800 cases and um for, for training spread across 18 common uh, common cancer origins. We, we tested it on a held out test set of about 6,500 cases on an external test set of about 680 cases. And then eventually on CUP cases that were submitted from over 150 medical centers across the US and uh, which had, uh, and then 317 of those cases had a primary differential assigned. So we did quite a lot of analysis on this. And the, the architecture that was used was very similar to the CLAM architecture, but it was multitask. So it was able to predict whether the slide is primary or metastatic as well as predicting whether what the, uh, what the origin is. Um, and then there's a lot of analysis that I'll skip through and it's available in the publication where we analyzed um, the primary versus metastatic performance, origin prediction performance at every every individual uh, origin, both for primary and metastatic cases, um, as well as looking at interpretability, both slide level interpretability and further analyzing the high tension regions to sort of validate that the the, 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 the model was making predictions from the, from the tumor regions. Um, another issue that um, I would like to cover is domain adaptation. If you train, I think this was also um, discussed in the previous talk, that if you train on data that looks something like this, it might not adapt to data that, that, that looks something like this. So the, the difference here can be in color, as is shown here. It could also be in resolution, for example, micron per pixel resolution, and how can we make the systems variable. Here's an example. So the, the CLAM models that we trained on whole slide images, we tried to adapt them to images that were taken with a cell phone coupled to a microscope, which is, is a, is a common way of, uh, of, uh, of capturing these images. Um, and uh, we found that there is a, there's a drop in performance. One, th th there have been a, a lot of uh, different ways where people have analyzed stain normalization, uh, but we found that MPP standardization basically helped quite a lot. So you can standardize the micron per pixel resolution between different scanners or, or any way the, the image is basically collected. Another approach that we are we just started exploring is by using phantoms. So standard optical phantoms have been used in optics for a very long time. And we can use some, this is the, the US Air Force phantom uh, and you can capture um, the, the, the absolute micron per pixel resolution using this and standardize it across your training and test cohorts. You can also, you can also use absolute color and distortion phantoms. There, this is a nice uh, phantom that was made available by the National Institute of Standards in the US. Um, this is specifically for computational pathology where you can standardize the, 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 your, your train and test models based off of these phantoms. The last thing sort of I'll talk about is, uh, is multimodal fusion. It's, uh, uh, multimodal fusion is, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's not as simple as, as people think. And of course, everyone wants to explore, explore this, but it has been an open question for a very long time. How do you fuse multiple modalities to predict, predict outcome? There are journals that are named, uh, named data fusion, and, and it's really um, one of those things that is, if you want to do it in, in, in a really simple way, it, it can be 
quite quite easy to do, but if you want to do it in a holistic way, it can be quite difficult. So the motivation behind it is, of course, that we know that both uh, histology images as well as molecular information is uh, very predictive of, of, uh, of outcomes and combining them might help in stratifying patients in, in a more holistic manner. Um, and we also know that deep networks on the whole slide image as well as deep networks on, on genomic information can uh, be used to predict outcome. So we did some uh, some analysis on this. A basic way of doing it is, is by concatenation. However, we found that that was not really intuitive. Uh, another way where we combine both CNNs, GCNs, as, as well as feedforward networks in molecular uh, features is by using a chronicler product. So we basically uh, build a chronic, uh, take the chronicler product of the feature vectors from the from all three of the networks, and then we have a fully connected layer, and we train everything end to end to end to for um, for for prognosis as well as for outcome um, outcome prediction. Um, we use GCNs here because it captures some some more of the of the tissue architecture. Uh, and then we also used uh, uh, sort of the, uh, the, the attention gating where we can project one modality onto the other uh, and, and essentially uh, trying to find what the most important information is from each one of them. So I just have one more minute to go. <laughs> so we, we, we did uh, quite a lot of analysis on this in a, in a, in a, in a recent um, pan cancer study that we, we have been working on where we tried to integrate histology whole slide images as well as genomic information that's holistic, uh, both transcriptomics as well as, as uh, mutations and everything. And we, we, we combined that in sort of an end-to-end -end fashion. And we can also look at interpretability, looking at a, at a whole slide level, what's important within the whole slide image and what's important within the, within the genomics. We found for 14 different cancer types, we were able to stratify nine of them in a statistically significant manner. We analyzed where the slide was more important, where molecular information was important, and what happened when you combine the two. There's a there's a nice demo for this that people can go to and look at for all of the 14 different cancer types we uh, we studied uh, with all the patients so in the TCGA and some additional patients where you can look at where the predictions were coming from and what molecular information was most uh, most important. Um, and then we also analyzed the high tension regions and found that the patients who, who had a better prognosis, their high tension corresponded with, um, uh, with, with, with a stronger immune response. And that's sort of consistent with what the community is, is, is sort of thinking. Um, and I'll, I'll just end here. I'd like to thank everyone who's working in the, in the group as well as all the funding we received to do some of this work. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Vasa. Really interesting and fascinating work and three excellent talks in the session. Would uh, it be possible, Andrew and Tom, to switch on your cameras and microphones so we can go through some of the questions? So first question is for Andrew. Uh, and uh, Emily is asking, who were the readers of the slides determining quality? Were they pathologists? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, those three readers were actually computational researchers like, like myself who you would expect them to have even more agreement because these are exactly the people that are kind of building these cohorts for their studies. Um, and, and it was wild. It was all over the place. Um, in our paper, we also did have a pathologist do the, the reading as well. Uh, and it was more, more discordant. Uh, and we, we, had a, we started with a small preliminary data set, I think maybe 50 slides or something uh, to kind of respect our pathologist's time. And the discordance was so high that it, it, we didn't even finish completing the experiment. So we realized then as well, and, and one of the points that we make in the paper is that more education is needed to help pathologists understand what a computationally sufficient slide is versus a slide that they could still use uh, simply because their experience is so vast and they've spent so many years, you know, kind of reading through blurry regions and artifacts that what's good for them is absolutely not good enough uh, for an algorithm. Uh, maybe, you know, in, in five or 10 years, we'll have better, <laughs> better algorithms for that. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the, the broad scope there. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Tom. And um, Raluca is asking, beyond the issues of consent, I believe a more difficult matter is that of accountability. Uh, who would be accountable for diagnostic errors when non-human assisted AI software is involved? Yes, well, um, I think that this general question is raised often for the whole class of autonomous systems, um, you know, and, and I think there are some fairly well canvassed solutions. Maybe there would be a shared responsibility uh, in the case, depending on the case between the developer of the software, uh, the user of the software, um, 
I, I guess the, the regulatory process it had gone through might also distribute some liability. Um, I guess it depends how typical the, uh, you know, the error is and, and so on. But broadly, um, you know, uh, those are the kinds of, of uh, areas of uh, liability that one would be looking at. And there's a comment about Vassal's talk and Dave is saying that uh, your talk perfectly illustrates why data lakes and archives are important as the larger the uh, the data set, uh, as the larger the archive, the more data or samples there will be for rare cases. So for example, I was really surprised you managed to get so many cases for CUB because yeah, you hardly see any. So uh, this shows the importance of that. Um, I think there's a question about bias. So, I mean, whoever feels happy to take it, um, um, it's synonymous. And basically they're asking, is the patient ethnicity recorded and used as part of algorithm development? And how are training sets determined? Are they the best examples of particular tumor types or are there cases that are coming through the diagnostic workflow and representative of a sort of routine pathology workload? Maybe Faisal can start and Andrew yeah. can pitch in. <clears throat> yeah, sure. So um, a majority of the cases that are used come through routine, uh, routine workflow. There, are, there have been cases where we're looking at something very specific and, and we would go through and have multiple readers read through the, the cases again and, and establish a consensus and, uh, and we would work with that. Uh, but typically for very large scale projects that we're working on, we, we use cases that come through the, the regular workflow. And the hope is that since deep learning is, is really robust to massive label noise and there's a lot of studies that I think a lot of people here have potentially looked at the Deep Gambler study that was published in Europe, uh, uh, I believe, last year. Um, so, uh, if if a majority of the labels are are correct, the the hope is that the model would be robust to to to, to a significant label noise. Um, uh, as for the other uh, question regarding uh, regarding race, so uh, race is is typically recorded; it's self-reported uh, here in the U.S. Um, and uh, for a majority of things that we've looked at, we don't have enough samples to investigate that in detail, but in, in, in a particular project that is for, for, for targeting race that we are currently working on, we've managed to get enough data from, uh, from, from multiple centers where, we, where we're trying to investigate the effect in, in detail. The issue is that for a lot of the radi radiology where um, race stratified cohorts are often investigated, they have a lot more data because it's part of routine screening, it's non-invasive, um, yeah, so. Great. I mean, I could just add, add on to that. So we, we mostly get our, our data sets in kind of retrospective studies. So we'll kind of work with pathologists and oncologists to retrospectively identify a specific cohort that meets certain certain criteria in terms of, let's say age, race, et cetera, so that we're, we're genuinely comparing apples, apples to apples. Um, I just wanted to add that we put out a paper recently that looked at African American prostate cancer, and we found that there, the predictive features in there are not the same ones as in Caucasian uh, Americans as well. So there, there is value in going forward and, and going and performing individual studies based off of ethnicity, which, which makes sense, right? I mean, Asians, uh, so like Chinese, the Han Chinese are, are susceptible to certain types of cancer much more than uh, their Indian counterparts, much more than their African counterparts or their, their Caucasian European counterparts. So there, there really is some, some underlying genetic uh, component there that's driving their disease. And at the same time, once you accept that, you should also accept that maybe the same feature set is not going to work universally across all types of breast cancer. Uh, and we've started to put out some, some work in that, that area. Great, I think we're just on to the last minute. So there's still a few questions in Q&A, particularly for Andrew, uh, if you don't mind answering some of those. Sure. Uh, I would just like to just uh, thank uh, all three of you again uh, for your fascinating work and talks. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, um, uh, I'm sure the audience did as well. So thanks a lot.